Thank you, Carl. Um, the title of my talk is Biochar, Black is the New Green. Um, when I started this talk, I was say, an employee of the University of Nevada, Reno, and when I finished the talk, you'll see by my entry slide that I'm currently employed by Washington State University. My position is wholly funded by the U.S. Forest Service and, and strangely, Oregon Department of Forestry. My biochar career started about six years ago when I was uh, at the University of Nevada, Reno, and my task was to find markets for a forest type known as pinion and juniper. Um, when, I, uh, when I do my analysis, I, I try to use some uh, known business models. The one I use to start out on biochar was uh, critical factors of success, and as you see them, uh, the, the first one was the resource supply, what and how much is available. For you that don't know out in the audience, that don't know what the pinion and juniper forest looks like, it looks like, well, it kind of looks like this picture right here, and they kind of look like little shrubs. As a matter of fact, I've got shrubs in my yard here in Spokane that are bigger than some of these trees. Um, the problem with the pinion and juniper forest type is it'll make, um, it'll make fence posts, uh, it'll make firewood, and that's about all, and those markets aren't very big. Again, my goal was to find markets so that we could sell the uh, the, uh, the, resi the, the forest residue and or the, the, the uh, biomass itself, make something out of it and get more money back to the land managers, primarily BLM and Forest Service, to take better care of the land. Um, you, can, uh, you can see that um, when we were talking, the other two speakers were talking about the history of biochar. Um, Biochar, the word itself, has only been you know, seen in literature for about the past 15 years. And in the one slide that was shown about the peer group papers, a tremendous interest has developed. So again, my goal is to develop markets for biochar and, and other biomass products. Um, well, if you don't have an industry, you have to invent an industry. And that's, what's, that's what we are seeing with biochar throughout the world. Uh, here's the model I use for industry development. First of all, you need enabling technology. You need an innovative business model that has a customer value proposition. That CVP is, is what allows the client to pull his wallet out of his pocket and, because he's overcome all the barriers to making that investment. Market adoption, you've got to get people to adopt the product. And then the key to the whole thing of, of selling the industry is, is favorable government policy, and I'll touch on that later. Well, the factor I chose here was market adoption. I felt that if I could if I could create enough interest for people wanting to buy the biochar, then the industry would be pulled as opposed to push. So um, the first thing I had to do was to make sure that the biochar created from the PJ, um, uh, the pine and uh, uh, juniper uh, furnish, was not going to do any harm. So I went to uh, Dr. Jim Ippolito, a, a, a peer of the two previous speakers, he's in the Northwest Irrigation and Soils Research Lab in Kimberly, Idaho. Um, I sent him uh, samples, four different samples of Nevada soil types, and he did a, a pot study. And he said, well, Dusty, I'm going to do this and this, and I'm going to use lettuce seeds. And I said, Jim, we, we don't grow a lot of lettuce here in Nevada, but we do grow alfalfa. So he switched to alfalfa seeds, and the importance of that is when I present his results, his research, it, it will relate much better to my audience or my early adapters. Um, through my work in biochar, I started to get invited to go on uh, podiums and explain to people throughout the Southwest what biochar was. And one of the potential applications was to use it in a, uh, in a reserve pit. Uh, those of you who don't know what reserve pits are, they're, they're kind of like swimming pools in the desert where we stick our uh, fracking fluids that we use in, in our um, oil and gas extraction. Well, this picture appeared in a BLM publication, and the purpose of that publication was to study mitigation efforts for um, these pits attracting migratory, uh, migratory waterfowl. And you can see if I can get my, area, my arrow down here. Well, it's not, well, maybe it's, yeah. You can see some dead birds in there, and that was one of their concerns. So after I showed this picture, one of the engineers came up, uh, came up to me and said, 
Dusty, that was the worst pit I've ever seen in my life. I want you to come out in the desert, and I want you to show you how QEP Industries does their pits. And, and you can see there's quite a difference in the construction of, of this pit over this pit. Well, as luck would have it, uh, this engineer said, uh, I am interested in biochar, and, and I'll uh, put some funding in, and you can come out and do a study. So I, I engaged the services of a guy named Chris Peltz, a, um, a research, his business is in Colorado. And he came down, and we designed a test, and we grabbed some char, and we mixed it into this area here. And, and the problem with the reserve pit is, and I'll go back to this slide, is this kind of, so, this is the topsoil, and it, in, in the A horizon, in this area is maybe just a few inches thick. If you go below that, that soil hasn't seen the light of day for several million years, and there's very little organic material in it. So we mix the char in it, and we set it out in different plots. And there were many, many different kinds of uh, uh, replicates. But this particular one, I'm showing this slide to show you some of the metrics that we use. These, these orange sticks. Let me see if I can get the arrow down. Well, I can't get it down again. These orange sticks here are uh, moisture monitors, and, and we had weather stations. We had 24-hour cameras going on this uh, on this uh, test site. Well, we had a snow event, and the, and you can see what those hay bales. And the reason we have hay bales instead of snow fence is we wanted to try a different approach using some organic material and see if the snow would keep the moisture in and around this particular zone. And you can see the buildup on the snow on the front of the pile, front of the bale, and on the top of the bale. And the results were this, and they're shown here. This is the soil moisture content taken over time this winter. And the red uh, line is the biochar, uh, biochar gypsum uh, mix. The uh, uh, green line is the gypsum only. And the uh, tan line is the, is the straw only. And you can see the area. Uh, I wish I could get that arrow down. My arrow is not working. so. Uh, just to the left, you can see an almost straight line. That's when the ground was frozen. When ground is frozen, the dielectric constant of ice is, um, is zero, and it won't transmit electricity. So that's, we didn't get any data during that period. But when we had these spikes shown by those arrows, we had weather events, rain and snow. And so we had some pretty good evidence that biochar indeed was increasing the moisture content of, of the uh, soil. And when you're planning and trying to grow things in the Utah desert, that's a critical element. So now, who's our customer? In this case, our customer are the oil and gas fat operators in the state of Utah. If you'll notice in the upper right and then the border on the upper left, there are no gas pads in Colorado and nothing going on in Wyoming, and you know that's not true. But in this particular case in Utah, there are currently 34,000 of these gas pads that need uh, that need uh, uh, remediated, and uh, in Utah, there's licenses to uh, put in another 20,000 more. So that's a pretty pretty good market, and 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 our our prime uh, uh, customer is the Bureau of Land Management because they're sponsoring a good portion of this research that Chris Phelps is doing. And so far, um, he's been showing some really really good results. And the end goal, the end game there, is to get the BLM to specify that biochar be used in remediation of these gas pads, and that'll give us a, a, a whole kind of a captive market, if you would, in that arena. Um, moving to another area, um, I, I think the largest market for biochar is uh, uh, broad-scale agriculture. Um, but we, we're focusing on, again, the, the, the moisture content improvement or moisture efficiency element of biochar. We were awarded a conservation innovation grant from the NRCS. And as you can see in the title there, uh, biochar field demonstration tri uh, trials, treatment within ag plots, and rehabilitation of pivot corners. And, and you see the uh, a pivot corner there in the right. Um, what happens in Eureka County, Nevada, they're about 50% oversubscribed in their water rights, which means farmers who have pivot circles I've got to take every other one down or figure out a way to grow a forage crop with less water. And that's what this trial is supposed to see, to see if we can put char in the corners, which aren't watered, and then put char in the various areas throughout that pivot circle. 
to see if in the field we can uh, increase the uh, growth or, or, or uh, ensure the survivability of a crop growing with less water. Um, this is an interesting potential market. This slide was taken in, in downtown Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the uh, operator there is drilling into a tree well. Uh, that's the Dr. Brant Scherenbrock, formerly of the, of the uh, uh, arboretum there. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to show the effect of adding biochar to a tree well. And, and why would we do that? Well, one of the important features of biochar is it's used as a filter. In this particular case, it snows in downtown Chicago a little bit, I'm told. And in the wintertime, the vendors or the, the merchants there, they throw, uh, they throw salt out on the sidewalk. And where does a lot of that salt go? It goes in the tree well. And that's not good for the growth of that tree. This experiment is, is, is currently underway. Uh, results show that the tree didn't die after they put the biochar in, and that's a positive thing. Um, working with other people in Nevada, we, uh, we thought that there'd be another uh, really, really good market, and that would be the urban uh, forestry market, and um, uh, particularly having to do with the survivability of the urban tree, uh, tree canopy. Um, they did a um, study in Clark County, Nevada, and about 30 of 30 percent of the trees in that area were dying. So we got $300,000 grant to, as you see, evaluate the utility of the PJ-derived biochar as a soil amendment to improve tree survival. Um, those of you who want to want to see how that study is going uh, can uh, uh, log on to a different portion here. Uh, get the uh, uh, get the uh, uh, what do I want to say? Oh, the URL and watch that YouTube video. It's very informative. And why would the urban forest be a particularly lucrative market? Uh, Ken Skaga, the Forest Products Lab, developed this little uh, method of how converting a yield from our national forest, that's 200 million acres, and converting it to biomass, and comparing it to the biomass that comes out of the urban area. If you went back to 2012 and did that, you could get about and converted all the timber that came out of National Forest. You'd get 6.1 million tons. The uh, formula that Ken Skog used in our cities um, uses uh, population as a, as a uh, indication of the supply of biomass in terms of biomass per capita. And uh, we estimate that about 16.1 million tons of biomass is coming out of our cities. So, and a lot of that biomass, of course, goes to landfills. So what we have to do is is see if we can convince the Parks Department and the urban foresters to do something with the biomass instead of burying it. Again, though, the big market is, is agriculture, U.S. agriculture. In the upper left-hand side, you see an opener. Uh, kind of think of it as a plow that doesn't disturb the land. And, and in the slide down below it, you see uh, what happens because they run tubes down around that opener, and they put uh, the white is a solid fertilizer on one side, and the seed is on the other. Well, uh, um, a um, peer of mine in New Zealand devised a way how to make a biochar slurry. And, and so he put, instead of putting the tubes that came across, uh, he, he put bio, he, instead of filling them with seed and fertilizer, he filled them with a biochar slurry. And that photo on the right, you can see the uh, impact of putting the biochar directly in the growth zone. So what we have to do is say, what is it all worth, Dusty, and how are you going to sell this stuff? Well, we have to figure out how to sell it. So generally, you want to read a, uh, a label on your product. And um, uh, at Cornell University, they just recently released this study. And, and what they're trying to do there, develop a biochar decision system. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the carbon storage class, fertilizer class, lining class particle size class, and, and, and that's key. I saw one comment here about, um, about uh, uh, particle size, and, and I, I hope I can address that maybe. Well, in this particular case, I'd be selling biochar from biosolids. We all know what biosolids are, mixed with eucalyptus wood produced at 550C. And from our previous speakers, you can see the production temperature is a critical factor in develop and, and determining the final characteristics of the char. So. All right, I'm trying to sell char. Well, if I was in 2012 and I was at the uh, Renard Park uh, USBI conference, 
I, I noticed this slide, and, and the average price uh, of that lady's um, uh, retail price study was a dollar and sixty-seven cents a pound, uh, the low of twelve cents a pound up to six dollars a pound. And one of the reasons that this was so high is because most of the char in that time was being made for, by small units for study. Um, another potential market. And, and I'm going to use this slide to go into the pricing per pound or, or per cup. Um, uh, Biochar Supreme, uh, you can Google for Bio, Biochar Supreme, and you can find this website, uh, Rennell Anderson in Everson, Washington. It's got a great business going. Let's concentrate on Mellow Mix. Um, Mellow Mix sells for $48 in a cubic foot bag. And, and what does that mean? Well, bricks mix at $48 per cubic foot, and a cubic foot has 120 cups. So that's uh, 40 cents per cup of char. So when, when you try to sell something to somebody, you've got to make sure you, you, they know how to use it. And we've had some questions and some examples of how much char not to put on your crop, depending upon what the crop is. In this particular case, uh, Dr. Ippolito said anywhere from 1% to 2% by weight is probably a pretty good mix. So in this particular case, uh, we advise hobby gardeners or uh, master gardeners to use two or three cups per square foot tilled in 78 inches. So what would that mean? Well, let's look at another, let's look at another example of, of price and economics. This is from Biochar Solutions website. Premium soil wheat reefs uh, sold at $195 a, uh, dollars a yard, FOB plant, and uh, premium chip mix. And you can see the difference in particle size, uh, and you can see the difference in that, that uh, 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 characteristic called butane activity, which is a test to show a surface area, and the surface area of the soil reef is much greater, and you can see that visually because the particles are much smaller. Well. What does that mean in dollars and cents? Well, at $195 a yard, there's 3,231 cups of char, so it's six cents a cup. Look at the bulk density at 20 pounds per cubic foot with 27 cubic feet per yard, cubic yard, 540 pounds per yard, or 36 cents per pound. That is a lot of difference between $1.67 a pound in 2015 as opposed to 2012. Well, I said we have to do a little bit better. If we're going to sell biochar and use it in an agricultural uh, venue, we're going to have to have a bigger system. We're going to have to make more char. So I went to a consultant, Bill Carlson of Carlson Small Power Consultants. He's a noted a boiler guy in the West Coast here. And I said, Jim, if I had a 3 megawatt CHP system, could I use it to make char? And he said, yeah. He said, normally you'd use 25,000 green tons and you'd get ash of 800 dry tons. I said, well, can I fiddle around with the control and let it burn less efficiently and, and, and leave more carbon into the, um, into the um, um, uh, residual? He says, yeah, you can do that. But in order to meet the requirement of the particular program that this three megawatt power plant was going to be in, I had to get more biomass because I was running inefficiently, and I'd need 4,800 more green tons. Uh, a lot of the studies show that it's about $50 a dry ton or $25 a green ton to move biomass, load it up, process it, and put it into some kind of a burner unit. So I got $120,000 extra for my process. Uh, the pounds of biochar and 2,000 tons of biochar would be, that would be about 4 million pounds, or the raw material cost alone of, of 3 cents a pound. So now, uh, recently there was an article published, and I thought it came out last week, about uh, acidity in Washington soils. And uh, the example the farmer used was said, well, if I use lime on my field to correct an acidity, it's going to cost me about $400, acres, uh, $400 an acre. Well, if we use the soil reef char at 36 cents a pound, and we needed uh, six tons of it, if that was the application rate, it would cost me $4,320 per acre. Well, the land might not be worth that much. But at three cents a pound, 
and uh, 2,000 pounds to the acre and six ton, 2,000 pounds to the ton and uh, uh, six tons per acre. It's only cost me $360. Now the benefit here is that the lime is going to go away pretty quick. The biochar is going to last, well, we don't know exactly how long it will last, but the terra preta soils have been around quite a while. People ask me, Dusty, seriously now, what's the end game for biochar? The end, my, I, I, I say, I don't know, I'm going to go up to about 30,000 feet and look down at, at this, uh, this U.S. farmland and British farmland and some other potential investments. And right now, there's a move on the part of some foreign countries, specifically the Chinese, to buy up U.S. farmlands and British farmlands. And if they can't buy it up, they're going to tie up the contractors in, uh, in, uh, in, in contract agreements. Um, you can see this data. It's called Field of Dreams. It comes from Bloomberg and uh, The Economist, among others. And you can see the annualized return of U.S. farmland and the volatility of those prices. And of all those investment, it looks like U.S. farmland is leading in terms of annualized return and uh, has uh, uh, volatility along with U.S. property and U.S. forestry. And of course, you see U.S. Treasury bills there. Uh, Global food security, that's what it's all about. Within the, my lifetime, there will be one billion more people living on this planet. And I ask you the question in my, one of my closing comments is, what are those one billion people going to eat? They're going to need food, and then we can grow it for them. Uh, President Obama recently said he believes in that the climate is changing. And he issued an executive order. And one of the things I'd wish you to add to the order is to look at this biomass piled up in a, in a national forest, and everyone watching this slide knows exactly what's going to happen to that biomass. As soon as they get a, the right atmospheric conditions, they're going to do what to those piles? They're going to burn them. And where's all that uh, CO2? It's going to go right up into the atmosphere. So my ending comment is there's a lot of things we don't know about biochar. We need science over the top to make sure that we do no harm. But early indications are that biochar increases the, in some, it generally increases moisture content and the growing uh, capability of plants, and best, better of all, it sequesters carbon. Again, uh, I'm Dusty Mahler. Here's my contact information. I'm with the Washington State University Renewable Energy Program.